Okay, a couple of people shaking their head. So let's say I, I've got all this news, right? Reuters has got journalists in 150 countries. And I want to get that news out to the world. Well, Reuters has this global system, terrestrial and satellite system. That let's say you're an earthquake, you're, you're a journalist in Chile, or you're in Japan, you're in Haiti, and suddenly, boom, earthquake, you get just shaken out of bed, right? You're in Japan. First thing you do, you run to your computer, type earthquake in Japan, and you hit enter. If you're a Reuters journalist, that story has to go worldwide instantaneously with no opportunity for arbitrage because it has to hit Bank of America's desk the exact same time it hits Morgan Stanley's desk, or else you can get on the phone and say, sell yen, right? So it's got to hit everybody's desk instantaneously. So I'm sitting at Reuters thinking, well, my goodness, this is a pretty powerful, a pretty powerful mechanism. But what does that remind you of? These little short, you know, blurbs in the subject line. Earthquake in Japan. Don't worry about filling in the story right now, you know. What, what, it, what where the epicenter is, the magnitude of the quake. You just got to get that story out, fill in the rest later. What does that little subject line remind you of? A tweet. A tweet, right? Right? Twitter? Subject line? Get it out there. Hey, this way maybe there's a tsunami coming. You know, I'd kind of like to know about that, living in Hawaii. You know, there's a tsunami coming because of this earthquake in Chile. So it's like a tweet, right? So essentially, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, this guy, you remember when the plane, Captain Sullenberger, familiar name? you know, heroically lands this plane in the Hudson River. Do you remember that? And everybody miraculously gets out alive. Well, this is the first guy who reported that story, a guy named Janice Crumbs. And look what he did. He put a link, this is the original tweet. He put a link to a picture, and then he said, there's a plane in the Hudson. I'm on the ferry going to pick up the people. Crazy. And then you link through, and this is the picture. He took a picture with his iPhone, and he uploaded it, and instantaneously the world knew something interesting was going on. And you don't have to be able to be literate to see there are literally people you know, waiting on the wings just to, to be rescued. So I started to think that, you know, I love going out for drinks with my Reuters colleagues you know, and comrades. And they were telling me that this was happening right outside their window. You know, Reuters is at four, at three times square. There's four buildings on the crossroads of the world, one, two, three, and four. Reuters building is three times square. It goes up 60 stories. And if you look out the northwest window, do you know what your view is? It's the Hudson River. Like, this was happening right in front of all these journalists. And I thought to myself, I didn't think it. I asked them, didn't anyone think to take up a camera, you know, to take a picture of this? So basically, this guy, Janus Crump, beats the world's largest news organization to a story that's happening right at their doorstep. What does that say to you? You know, everyone in this room, every one of you has the ability and reach and the power and the immediacy of the world's largest news organization. Every single one of us. We're living in incredible times. You know, we don't need millions of dollars in infrastructure and journalists in 150 countries. The London train bombing, you know, look at all these events that have happened from citizens actually contributing stories. So everybody told me when I'm putting together a book, oh, you know, there's a revolution, right? This is a revolution in publishing. You've got to pay attention to this. There's a revolution in radio, especially in musicians. Oh my God, there's a revolution going on in the music industry. But you know, there's too many revolutions here for this to be a coincidence. What's the only thing bigger in human terms, in media terms, than a, than a revolution? It's a renaissance, right? When, when, when was the last renaissance? They don't come around very often. I think I can name you know, three or four. But when they come around, man, they have a tremendous impact. They don't last a couple of years or a decade or a century. They, their impact is felt for millennia, right? If you don't believe me, look at the year zero. The 500 year period before Christ was born, the 500 year period afterwards. Jasper John refers to it as the axial age, the first human renaissance. And think about it, four corners of the earth, you had all these sages, completely isolated. Gautama Buddha in India, Confucius and Lao Tzu in China, you know, in Mesopotamia, in Greece, you got Plato and Socrates. I mean, this is the beginnings of democracy and centralized currency. And then, of course, in the Middle East, we had Jeremiah and Muhammad, you know, the beginnings of Islam and Christianity. If you don't think Renaissance is having an impact, why are we still arguing and fighting and following the spirituality, the philosophy, the religion of people who walked the earth 2,000 years ago, right? Renaissances are major. They're, they're huge. 
revolutions are like a blip on the evolutionary radar screen. And you know, the other thing about Renaissance is they're usually peaceful, which is nice. You know, compared to revolution, which can be a little bit bloody. But their impacts felt for a while. So who are the sages today, walking today, sir? How do we judge, you know, what is the number of followers? Is that what we should do? I mean, we could do that, right? You ever go to Twitter Holic? <laughs> it ranks, you know, the top thousand Twitterers, the twitterholic.com. But who do you think the top Twitterers are? Anybody? By number of followers. MSNBC. MSNBC. Go Han Wan Tao. Anybody else? Athletes. Athletes, yeah. So anyway, what, sorry, that was Twitterholic. Well, basically, Twitterholic says the top of Twitterer is Ashton Kutcher. 4.6 million followers. Anybody know who he is? Ashton Kutcher. Yeah. Married to Demi Moore. He's the sage of today. You know, you have Britney Spears is number two. Second most followed person. And number three is uh, Ellen DeGeneres, right? What kinds of tweets, what kind of messages are, are these false prophets? Are these fads? You know, do you think Ashton Kutcher's message will last in the year 4,000? 3,000, maybe next year. You think it's gonna be relevant? So who are those sages, right? What are they tweeting? I mean, when Moses comes down from the mountaintop, at the 10 commandments, those are pretty good tweets, right? I mean, think about it, thou shalt not kill. That's a good tweet, right? That's still relevant today. You think it'll be relevant in the year 4,000? Yeah. Sure, people are gonna follow that, right? I would say you are what you tweet, you know? But interestingly too, in that, thousand year period in the year zero. Interestingly enough, all of those cultures were facing violence and reacting to violence in their own societies. And interestingly enough, they came up with a similar theme. You know the golden rule? You ever heard of the golden rule? Yeah. What's the golden rule? Whoever has the gold makes the rule. <laughs> Whoever has the gold makes the rule. Treat others as you wish to be treated. Right. Or as I like to say, tweet unto others as you would have them tweet you. Right? In Twitter parlance. So what are the kinds of things, who are the sages we're following today? What are the kinds of messages that they're putting out? Are we following and consuming Britney Spears and Miley Cyrus and Hannah Montana? You know, who do you think are some of the sages of our times? Last 50 years, just anyone. Yeah? Jimmy Wales. Jimmy Wales. <laughs> Wikipedia, open source, yeah. Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh. He's very popular, you know, he's dominating our public airways and not paying a penny in rent to use them but he certainly makes a lot of money, but yeah. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. How about Gandhi? How about Martin Luther King? Yeah. Or Cesar Chavez, right? Mother Teresa. So who are we following and who are we not following? What are the, th what are the things we can do? So it's not just who you're following, it's you. I would wager that in this room is a sage, maybe more than one sage that's ready to express themselves. Because if you, if, you weren't, if you didn't care about media and about having an impact on society, you probably wouldn't be in this room. But because you do, I'm assuming that each of you wants to get your message out, share it with the world. And that's really what our current renaissance is about. It's completely different than anything in history. Because anybody can participate. It took thousands of years to spread the gospel. Why? Why did it take so long? Yeah. The printing press was invented. The printing press wasn't invented until 1450. So then you also had to translate all of those Bibles, right? So it took even longer for the Quran, which was in a tricky language, that needed to be translated as well. But the Bible was written in Aramaic. How many people speak Aramaic? Just by a show of hands. Yeah, you know, language limits your audience. You got to, you got to translate it. You got to get it out there. You know, the Torah was uh, was written down so they could speak it. The crowd was illiterate, right, in those days, so they had to speak the Torah. But today, it's not going to take 2,000 years. If you've got a good idea, and you've got a great message, you know, it's as easy as just taking a cell phone and uploading it. Just like Janice did, right? So when I started looking at being the media, everybody's telling me, oh yeah, there's all these revolutions. You better get involved in the revolution now. It's bigger than that, and it's broader than that, and it's gonna be unlike anything that's ever happened in human history. And we're probably maybe 100 years into it.